I've mentioned on this channel before, what with the various videos I've done about tabletop role-playing games, I'm a fan of tabletop role-playing games. And if you've read the reviews on my blog before, I'm also a fan of learning about the history of things, particularly science and technology and various geeky things. So when I learned about the book Art and Arcana, which is basically a history of Dungeons and Dragons through its art, my interest was piqued. The book pretty much does what it says on the cover. It chronicles the art of Dungeons and Dragons from literally the original three pamphlets in a cardstock box with a wood grain pattern to the present day, with all points in between being covered in depth. Well, present day as of when the book came out. You know what I mean. We have coverage of all the various TSR campaign settings, more or less. Red Steel doesn't get much mention, but that's kind of an extension of Mistara, sort of. Mistara does get mentioned. Planescape, um, Birthright, which I mentioned back on uh, Tabletop Roleplaying Recommendations Year Interview thing. Um, Ravenloft, Forgotten Realms, obviously Forgotten Realms. Greyhawk and Dragonlance all get covered art here as well as various other products in between. And we get coverage of all of, not all, but many of the biggest name artists to work on Dungeons and Dragons. I say not all, because while we get some profiles on Larry Elmore, Jeff Easley, Dave Sutherland, and Errol Otis, for example, and some in-depth stuff where we get like big full page or multi-page spreads of some of the favorite works of some of the artists, we don't get much more in-depth profiles for some of the other major names to work on d, &D games. For example, we get information from interviews with Brom on his creative process for the Dark Sun campaign settings. We don't get too much detail on his background before coming to work for um, TSR, nor do we get notes necessarily on his departure and his later career, because Brom is one of those artists who became something of a fixture on the cover of Heavy Metal magazine, along with uh, Louis Royo. Similarly, we get notes on Tony DiTolisi, who find the look of Planescape to a tremendous degree, and who illustrated much, if not all, of the uh, Monstrous, uh, Monstrous Manual. And he's gone on to co-create some incredibly successful young adult and children books, like the Spiderwick Chronicles. But you don't get much notes in his career before or after working on D&D. I came upon the connection to Spiderwick Chronicles while doing my research for this review. Bill Willingham gets mentioned, and there's no mention at all that after his less than amicable slash completely hostile departure from TSR during the Lorraine Williams era, he would go on to be the creator of Fables. I get why these are omitted. More room for text means less room for art. But there's some value in a this is where this artist is now bit at the book, uh, in addition to capsule biographies in the line of the text. I have something that serves as a jumping off point for people who want to check out other works by a particular artist. That said, there's a lot to like here. Documentation of the history of TSR itself and their settings is very well done. Helped by two of the authors of this book are um, John Peterson, the author of Playing Out the World, which is a book that covers the history of tabletop role-playing games leading up to the initial publication of Dungeons and Dragons, the three pamphlets, and kind of leading into D&D Basic, along with Michael Whitwer, the author of Empire of the Imagination, the biography of Gary Gygax. Um, the latter book I have reviewed in prose on the blog. I will put a link in the show notes. I'll try to put a little annotation thing. The two I've done combined a tremendous amount of research into the history of TSR and Dungeons and Dragons from on their earlier books, so they're excellent for this one. Additionally, as mentioned earlier, the book has a tremendous amount of very large, very high quality pictures of various pieces of art and of various products from the history of Dungeons and Dragons. I mentioned before that you we, you have of some of the artists who are featured in the book, they get highlighted bits for some of their favorite pieces that they worked on dragons and we go even more of that with two page spreads of in-depth art from various Dungeons and Dragons source books in here um 
all without the trade dress, like just the art. So like you have like a bit from a cover of a role playing game book, but we're taking the cover text out of here, the Forgotten Realms logo or Dungeons and Dragons logo, and we just let the art speak for itself and showcase and stand out and show you how good Otis and Easley and Elmore and all these wonderful artists are. And also, initially, so we see a good look at a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons merchandising products, which are hard to come by and are really interesting to see. Stuff like the Dungeons and Dragons needlepoint set, the beach towel, um, which uses a dungeon map motif for the towel design, which is kind of neat. That said, there are some <clears throat> very odd emissions. Gene Wells' final project for TSR, the adventure in the Palace of the Silver Princess, is mentioned, along with the fact that the book was recalled because of the art, officially recalled and pulped because of the art from Errol Otis, ostensibly containing objectionable Freudian imagery. <clears throat> like orifices that look like vaginas. However, the only version of the cover we get is the reprint cover of the original, so we don't have the chance to judge for ourselves. Considering that when I heard about this adventure being recalled, and that Jean Wells is one of the first women to publish officially licensed material for Attendant and Dragons, that recall and pulping always felt a little bit sexist to me, a little bit off in the back of my mind. I it always felt a little sexist even before I heard of the concept of social justice, or the whole, at least heard the words, or had had heard any actual discussion on the concept of feminism. Even before that, I thought, yeah, that's why. Why is this book being recalled, rewritten by a guy, and reprinted? I think had they included the offending material, it's a big coffee table sized art book. It's not like some kid's going to buy this. And there's plenty of other material from the early days of D&D &D that is somewhat levacious that is in here as well. The, the succubus from the Monster Man. Um, and so I think showing the offending material would be a necessary and useful inclusion both in the sense of telling the story of this particular incident and telling the story of Dungeons and Dragons as a whole. Um, it's how in the, I'm not going to say the bad old days, but in the old days of first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and D&D Basic, where you'd have this more risque, more outsider art material in Dungeons and Dragons with stuff from Earl Otis and others, um, stuff that is more avant-garde, that gets into the kind of the weird Freudian psychedelic territory that you get. You, you look at Otis's art and you look at other art from contemporaries who are doing similar kind of out there stuff. Like, I would consider Otis in the same sort of style as, say, a H.R. Giger, though, he, though they're, in terms of the type of the medium in which they do their art, and the and how things pan out are very different. Eager is both organic and very industrial, whereas um, those were those were a balance of uh, industrial and organic. Um, he's more likely to do a maquette to make how to put it gracefully. Sexual imagery look industrial and cold and clinical, whereas Otis is always going to focus, feel like he'll focus more on the organic side of things. Um, that is, when he, when he goes organic and Freudian, his art looks wetter, messier, squishier. Um, and seeing that contrast of going from this 
not gross in it's a disgusting and bad sense, but a gross in like the sensation you get when you stick your hand in um, a mixture of uh, corn starch, water, and marbles. Um, goop and mar goop sl slime and marbles. Um, it does give it a weird texture, lumpiness. Um, like that style of art for Otis going into the more clean, established, heroic um, art of you get the second edition with with Jeff Easley, with Larry Elmore, even to an extent with Brom, where Brom's art is more conventional, not a conventional sword and sandal, but it evokes that sword and sandal, sword and planet style of uh, Conan and uh, John Carter of Mars and that sort of thing. And then moving on into even the more imaginative dream state, dreamscape art of Dutalizian Planescape. Having that evolution is, I think, a big deal. And incorporating like the stuff of Otis's that they printed and thought that this crossed the line and pulled back, having that imagery, I think, was important. And the book is, a, is somewhat lesser. Not like, it's not bad because it's not there, but I think it's important. I think something's missing by not having it be there. Art and Arcana is absolutely worth picking up, both as an engaging read for fans of Dungeons and Dragons and history, and just as a really nice coffee table art book. If you enjoy fan art, and in particular, if you like having a story attached with it, like if you picked up paperbacks from hell, not just because, oh, I enjoy reading paperback fiction, uh, paperback horror fiction from like the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, and talking about it and that sort of thing, but also looking at the covers and sharing that and being the story in contact with each other, having that uh, you'll get the same kick out of art and arcana because it's telling a history through art and telling it very, very well. The book is available at Amazon.com and there will be a link in the show notes below. Buying anything through that link helps support the site. Next time, we get back to Legends of the Force um, for the next, for the conclusion of the Droid series. And then after that, let me look at my calendar real quick. Actually, yeah. Legend of the Forest Droids ongoing then, and then the following week. I haven't done a week, the week of movie review before. So my next Breaking It All Down episode, all goes well. I'll be talking about Alita, Battle Ranger. See you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.